It's my deep, deep honor to thank some people. Um, this event is put on by dozens of people who work all year long to make this happen. And uh, first of all, as I look straight ahead, I want to thank our writers and our presenters. I want to thank you for being here, and even more so, I want to thank you for your work because you're the heart and pulse of humanity and the rest of the world hears that and we know things only because of you, even if that's often not acknowledged. We exist on that, so thank you. Okay. I would like to thank our major sponsors, uh, media partners, NDTV and Multimedia Auto, you know, Audiovisual, who has pr um, produced all the sound at the library this entire weekend, and it has just been extraordinary, an enormous amount of work. Um, the SCFD, the Science and Cultural Facilities District of the State of Colorado, supports us. The City of Boulder, the Boulder Public Library, the Boulder Arts Commission. We have a knowledge partner, Videre Institute, um, National Endowment for the Arts funds us through grants. The Colorado Fine Arts Association has sponsored all our music this year. Uh, Colorado Creative Industries, Bhakti Chai, Community Foundation of Boulder County, the Human Relations Commission of, of the City of Boulder, uh, the Tibet Himalaya Foundation, Wallaroo Hats, Boulder Bookstore, thank you, Tananson Cafe, thank you. Um, there are just so many partners we have, hospitality partners, the hotel system of uh, Sage Hospitality, the University Inn, um, our catering partners, the Boulder Dishanbe Tea House, Dagabi Kusina, Jaipur Restaurant, yeah. <laughs> Boulder Public Library, David Farnan, thank you. You also wouldn't all be here without David having invited the festival to occur in the library. Um, Kathy Lane, director of programs. Christine Burke, Kate Kelch, Sophia Siraj. I don't know how you do what you do, but they are organized well over 100 volunteers. 140? I don't know, I don't know how they do what they do. So, um, our venue manager is Johnny, Johnny Teeter. It's an extraordinary job that they do all weekend. Harris Armstrong in, in uh, Brook, uh, Jackie Osborne in Steps, Melen Villard in the Canyon Theater. Um, our Colorado production team, renting all these chairs, putting them out, packing them up. <laughs> You name it, Kevin Smith Productions with the inimitable Kevin Smith, Lisa Bell, Sophia Antal, Kayla Carter, Jackie Osborne, Stephen Zanowick, and Aaron Smith. We just can't thank you enough. Our advisory board that has supported me with ideas and cheering me on for several years, Brooke Eddy, Heather Collins, Jennifer Heath, Jules Levinson, Maruta Collins, Mega Sood and Rohan Sood, Michael Carter and Stephanie Carter, Sujata Subramanian and Susan Josephs. Um, our publicist, Heather Collins, and uh, our major sponsors. The, our most major sponsors prefer to remain anonymous. <laughs> and the Agrawal Foundation, Chicha Banerjee, Diva Karuni, the George Lichter Foundation, Rohan and uh, Mega Sood, Bodhi Medipa, thank you. Uh, we have one more, I just am um, forgetting. Surge is here to um, 
pitch in for anybody I've forgotten. Oh, our media partners, Brock Media, KGNU, The Daily Camera, The Boulder Weekly, and CPR. <clears throat> Thank you all so much. And now we will get to the more fun part of uh, some poetry um, and um, an important final session. Thank you all. And I'd like to introduce Jovan Mays. So we're, today we're going to talk, I think, in this panel about art censorship, literary censorship. Um, and I was asked to read a poem here today, and I was thinking about my catalog and what stands out to me in this conversation. And this is um, the poem that kind of came to my mind is a, this poem um, that I've written in partnership with the Equal Justice Initiative, um, which is an organization that's focused in on getting wrongfully accused people um, out of prison. Um, they've curated this fantastic museum and memorial in Montgomery, Alabama, that specifically celebrates individuals uh, who were victims of racial terror lynchings um, throughout the history of the United States. Um, they created this project that's called the Community Remembrance Project, which employs citizens in their own statehood to investigate their statehoods history with racial terror lynchings. And in 2016, I, with another a group of five other individuals, started a task force to investigate Colorado. Um, the first story that came up for us came up for us pretty quick um, because there's quite a bit of writing on it. And I'm just gonna read to you uh, the pretty clean cut writing of what took place. On Friday, November 16th, 1900, a large white mob lynched a 15-year-old African-American teenager named Preston John Porter Jr., who was burned to death near Lyman, Colorado in Lincoln County. Preston and his family were arrested while in Denver and interrogated about whether they were involved with the rape murder of a white farm girl named Louise Frost. Intense white, intense white racial hostility during this era blundered black people with the presumption of guilt often leading to unfounded and unreliable accusations. Before Preston could have a fair trial, a white mob lynched him, denying his humanity and constitutional right of due process. What this bio does not include is the fact that by most descriptions, Preston Porter Jr. was a special needs individual in our society. This poem is called To Preston. Sometimes I wonder, at what age do we know our songs? At what time do our bodies become our melodies, our cadences, our chords? I can still hear my grandma humming a ditty into a meal. And I wonder what your father sang, Preston, to trick you and your brother's hunger into bedtime to trick the house into cradling itself to sleep. Yeah, sometimes I wonder. I wonder if we all have the same fascinations with fire. Lord knows you must not. The act of putting a fresh log into the stove and watching the house cradle itself to sleep. Do you ever wonder where embers go? Have you imagined their return to the sun? I hope you did, Preston, because a star ain't nothing but a fire. You know, I've gathered lumber for long winters, and I know you know such work, how to get into a log hurling rhythm, how to trick up the speed to stack fast. They call a full truck bed of firewood a cord, and four full cords should get you through the winter. But there goes those cords again. Did you get to know your song? They say in music, a melody is a chord made up of three harmonies, and I think about you tearing out the pages of the Gospel of Luke and handing them to your future executioners. One, 
two, three, and how they use those as invitations to your concert, your solo on that stake, your terror on that tie, the cadence of your chains accenting a symphony of splinters as your throat became their justice. Do you think they heard you, Preston? Did they register the register of your wails, your weeping, Preston? Did they hear your family in your lungs as your kin became their kindling? Did they catch the signals in your smoke? In the eastern plains of Colorado, the wind can be spellbinding. Sometimes it can even sweep. And Lord, how we watch them sweep you under our flagged rug, swept your remains so that you would not. But I think of a sweep and how it can be uplifting, how it can carry you when you can't carry yourself. Oh, I know wind. Out here in these plains, they farm wind, turn binded. They watch their houses cradle themselves to sleep. But at night, when it's just you and the moon, if you listen to the night, you'll actually hear the wind howl. And they say that wolves wail to the sky to call in the pack. And if this is true, then what else is a howl but a song calling us in to a choir of chords Bottled in confession and confusion, teenaged and tormented, wondering if it was ever heard, but somewhere, under all that smoke, under all that brimstone, in that Holocaust combustion was a song constructed by a Preston Porter Jr. We say your name. We play your chords every time we hear the wind howl on the eastern plains, calling us in, reminding us that we have some songs to teach. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> and what a great start to the final session. Forbidden Pages, banned, burned, and censored. Books are dangerous, as we've just seen demonstrated. As dangerous as the often unexpected and subversive ideas they contain. This is a session that examines the rationale of banning books across time and social landscapes while also critically examining censorship and severe reactions to literary criticism and the socio-political milieu this reactionary environment re represents. The panel, I think, is familiar to everyone from the afternoon. They've been in sessions all day, so I'm just going to share their names and have them come on up. So David Farnan, who's director of the library, Arson Kashkanian from the Boulder Bookstore, Martin Puchner, who's a professor with a number of books, Ruchira Gupta, who's an activist in documentarian, and Sanjay K. Roy, who is the director of Teamwork Arts. Thank you. Hello. That howl is a song. Uh, it's just incredible. Jovan, thank you so much. I also wanted to acknowledge and thank uh, Jesse, who's been uh, the leading light and who will be stepping down as executive director uh, this year, in the ninth year, along with our advisory board. And we look forward to welcoming our new executive director and our new board shortly, and we'll be announcing that. So Jesse, uh, <laughs> lots of love, and thank you for bringing us here, you and Jules. I, I wanted to just poll the audience. How many, any of you are on the school boards or anything? Anybody here on a school board or a, or a kindergarten board or li library board or anything? Yeah, one or two. So I wanted to start by asking you all that everybody says that, you know, books, nobody's reading them. 
we're all obsessed with social media and Facebook and all of that. And yet, this year in the United States alone, you've banned more books than any other part of the world. What, how is it that it suddenly become so powerful? David? <laughs> Thanks, Sanjoy. Um, yeah, why, I, you know, it's, um, it's not new, um, but it d has taken a different form, I think, right? So um, book banning has been around, book banning, word banning, and I'm, I, I ha I'd be remiss after Joanne's poem not to mention that in Plato's Republic, which many of you know, like the best way, what, what's the first thing a ruler, a good ruler does to establish a, a decent state is to banish all the poets, right? So the first, the first thing you do is banish all the poets, um, and for many reasons, maybe we'll get into them, but um, you know, the thing that's happening now, I initially, I thought like it's not that much different than what I experienced in libraries in the late 80s and early 90s, um, but it is different uh, in the sense in which um, it is a culture war, I think without a doubt, it is culture wars. Uh, it is informed by, um, you know, group opinions, um, but driven in a way that unlike what we've seen before, and that is uh, through legislative issues. And I think that part of it has been, uh, you know, there's there appear to be grassroots groups, which it's difficult to tell how the grassroots group grew so fast or how it's funded. Um, and they have taken on uh, a shape where it's not a single book with an angry parent, which is something quite common in libraries. You have a single book with an angry parent. This is more of a group <laughs> of parents um, Moms for Liberty being the biggest one uh, that originated in Florida that, uh, among two former school board members uh, that bring a list of books. It's not one book, it's not two books, it's a list of 40, 50, 70, 100 books. Um, and they are challenged as to whether or not these books belong within a certain age group or within a, this school or why the school would provide those books. That, that, character, that manner and then the, the legislative side in which librarians, uh, public librarians, as well as school librarians, um, are being subject to um, criminal uh, accusations, right? So pandering of pornography or um, uh, pandering uh, obscenity. And that, that is different, right? That, that puts uh, the, the librarians uh, squarely in the crosshairs of, of legislative issues which is supported by many states uh, within our country. Um, I think predominantly where they come from. I, I, I want to hold you to that, and I'm going to come back in a second about the sexual content. Martin, in, in, in earlier times, uh, you didn't like a, a writer or a poet. You just poisoned them or you put them to death. <laughs> so much more convenient and easy. That's but foundational texts in many ways just continued to outlast these marauding victorious generals across time. And those foundational texts that you write about, it didn't matter that they were banned or their writers were poisoned or put to the stake. They just outlived millennia uh, to continue to be our foundational texts. It, it, it's true. Uh, and as people have said, book banning is not new. And it, you know, when I tried to write the history of literature, it became also the history of book burnings and book, you know, book bannings uh, and all of that. And in some sense, uh, a lot of texts have gone through phases of that uh, and survived in one way or another. Uh, um, and you know, there are various strategies of survival. One is to be widely distributed among many different cultures in many places. Uh, in my most recent book, for example, I write about the moment in Tang Dynasty China when China turns against Buddhism and you know, st starts to round up Buddhists, close monasteries uh, and texts. But fortunately, Buddhist had, Buddhism had, of course, it still existed in India. It had traveled to many other places, including Japan. So allowing yourself to be borrowed and adopted by other cultures is actually a very good survival strategy. Um, so yes, you're absolutely right. Book burnings, uh, some deliberate, some inadvertent, uh, are part of the history of literature. And, and the texts from the past that we still have survived those events, and many have. Um, so you're basically saying if a book travels well, it will outlast. 
I think I think it, it it's true because it's you know even here book bannings happen in certain states but not other states. I think the if you if you manage to as a book to be translated into different languages, you know that that absolutely increases your survival chances. How many of you have written the read, read the Color Purple? Do you know it's banned? Yeah. Ruchira, it's banned because of its sexual content. Going back to what David said, it's basically banned not because of its sexual content. It's banned because of racism. And uh, I had a long conversation with Alice Walker about it. What does she think? Uh, and she says that there are so many layers for reasons behind banning. So the manifestation may be a word that somebody will come up and pick and say, this is why we are getting it banned. But actually, there is much more behind it, even pornography, which uh, David was talking about, actually. Uh, you know, most of the times when we examine what a parent has called pornography, it's not pornography. In Pennsylvania, for example, a scholastic book was banned. And the reason a parent objected to it was because the word breast was used in it. In, uh, pencil, in um, recently, a friend's book was banned in Texas. And all she had done was an anthology of um, young girls' experiences of their first menstruation just to help them get over stigma and shame You know, when you experience your first menstruation. So these are not things which are uh, pornography or exploitative. They are information for people, for especially young adults. This culture war is really big right now. And it helps them feel less lonely. And so uh, the book banning thing is really a manufactured thing which is happening in America right now because it's an organizing tool for a political party to go ahead. The governor of Iowa has banned uh, all books with any sexual content or mention of sexuality in it. How many of you as parents would support that? That's a pretty good group. Arson, <laughs> Arson, back, you know, Boulder Bookstore, you have hundreds of thousands of books coming through your door. I'm sure you want some of them banned. I mean, you don't even have shelves <laughs> enough to, to hold them. Come on. Well, you know, you know, only the only the really good books get banned. You know, there's <laughs> there's plenty of books that you know aren't worth you know you know especially now almost a million books a year are printed, but it's not those books that maybe don't deserve the time on the shelf that get banned. It's going to be the color purple, which is one of the great books I think of 20th century American literature. And to me, I, I feel like the, we're, the books are almost a sideshow to kind of this right now at least, this Trumpism that's going on. And it feels like just another piece of this bullying culture. But Arson, there was banning of books even pre-Trump. Oh, of course, I understand, but it's picked up immensely. And these Moms for Liberty are post-Trump. The, the, what we're seeing, and this legislation, that's really what's different. I think that's really what's scary. You know, uh, if, if it's a school board that bans a book, you know, in, in Tennessee, they ban Mouse. Art Spiegelman, right? You know, one small district in Tennessee, you know, 50, 100,000 copies of that book sold in the, in the subsequent couple months. So you could say the net is positive. It's just a tiny little thing. But when the sta state of Texas is going to criminalize uh, librarians and teachers, Florida, the same thing. W one interesting thing that came across us was uh, in the book business was that Florida used book dealers are having one of their best years ever. And the reason is just tragic. Teachers are selling every book in their classroom before the school year started because they didn't want to get caught with a book they shouldn't have. And so it was a boon to it, for the used books because they had everything. And it's just a terrible to think about that. Like, so your kid goes in the classroom and there's no books at all because there could be, a, you know, the word breast could be hidden in one of these books, right? And it's just, that's the difference to me is this big push and this legislative, and I, I don't think it'll stand the test of time in the courts, but of course that's a big effort to get these things to court, and what teacher wants to be, have their career in limbo for three years while it's figured out? D David, tell us what exactly this banning means, say, to the library. In Colorado, uh, five books have been banned in different school districts. Four of them is about LGBTQ books. 
One is on, on a teenage guide to sex. So it's more an educational book that's been banned. So what does that mean, that a library can't stock it or you can't stock it, but in a different shelf? Or it doesn't matter and you know, tell the legislature to take a walk? I mean, what does it mean in actuality? Well, uh, we have a process, right? And there are libraries currently that are um, questioning whether that process isn't uh, um, generating uh, protest because we do have a regular process. It's been in place for years. I mean, in, in Boulder, in the Boulder Public Library, we have no books that are banned. There is no state injunction on any type of books. Uh, we occasionally uh, have challenges, right? So the challenge of a book, uh, you know, 20 years ago, challenge of a book was a parent who didn't like a book and, you know, and, 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 and I, I don't want to oversimplify it, but you can kind of characterize it in a way as parental panic, right? Their kid is suddenly into things and asking hard questions about, um, about race or about sexuality or about their own sexuality, and then the parent doesn't know how to react and they can't talk to their kid, of course, because they're 14, and so they come to the library and ask for the book to be removed. Um, you know, we have, as a bedrock principle, libraries have three bedrock principles. We're free and open to all. We resist censorship in all of its forms, right? So that is, we have a whole process. They fill out a form. I have five staff members who read the book. We look at reviews. I read the book a lot of times. We then uh, write a response. We try to talk to the person about, like, do you realize that you're asking for this book to be removed from the shelves means that no other person can read it? Um, and oftentimes that's where they back off, right? Um, and they decide like, that's not what my intent is. And you know, I, I don't tell them, go talk to your 14 year old son, um, which is what I wish I could say. Um, but you know, they, uh, so that the process, should it go pa uh, to the highest level, then it ultimately requires me uh, to uh, claim in some cases for books that I know to be absolute garbage or absolutely untrue, or just total, you know, not, you know, just not worth. I, I write the justification for why this book is in the collection, and the justification for why that book is in the collection is that we restrict no form of speech. We res we resist censorship in all its forms. And this justification goes to whom? Uh, to the person who made the challenge. Uh, the board would then have a chance. They could obviously then, the way Boulders has their set up, it's me. Um, the board uh, could decide to fire me based on that uh, or stand by that decision. In many libraries in Colorado, uh, the board is the last uh, step of, of that uh, process, uh, which is subject to a lot more, um, you know, I don't know. So, so the buck, <laughs> in this case, the buck stops with you. It's not that there's another place that they can go on to appeal, a court or the city or the city. That is the case. So the, the city has an, the, the city and the current job, and I'm doing two jobs now. I'm the librarian for the city and then also the library for the brand new library district. And several of my trustees are here. Uh, so um, yeah, so the city has entrusted that responsibility within me. Um, they could remove me from my job, but they would not, uh, I mean, I suppose they could take over that control of whether or not who decides what books are banned. The Board of Trustees has agreed uh, so far uh, that to also entrust me with that responsibility. Martin, will you give us a historical perspective about how books came into being and, and, and in many ways, how did they fo become foundational texts and the kinds of books that were banned over time? It's a large uh, this subject. This writing his whole book <laughs> in a few seconds. But. Yes, it's easy. Um, so, I mean, the history of the book, it starts not with books, but with clay tablets, then we have scrolls, then the, Rom the Romans really invented what we now call, what was called the codex, the book where you sort of flip through. And now we scroll again on our, uh, you know, on our electronic devices and we look at our tablets. So I've been very interested in how these old formats are coming back. Um, but so, that it, and it is in part a history of technology, of course, the invention of writing in different forms of writing in different parts of the world, including the new world, uh, and, and, and how those writers, including the early writers, chose to write down oral stories. So it's about the inter intersection between oral storytelling, which continues, mm -hmm. Uh, uh, and, and different writing technologies and how it gets into writing and who controls it. Uh, you know, first you have scribes, uh, very specialized uh, 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 
experts of writing, and then you have the printing press, but then you know you, you have a m mass publication market, but people control the press itself. So in some sense, that was was very very easy to censor. Uh, um, in the book, I have a chapter about the Soviet Union uh, because the state was able to control the printing process. Uh, the, the, the chapters about Anna Akhmatova, the poet, who said that she's forced into a world before Gutenberg, that is before print, and actually in the end she, wo she was only felt safe to compose her poems orally and teach it to her a group of female friends. So in a sense, censorship forced her into a purely oral culture. Uh, because no one dared to write down her poems. Because Stalin, and this goes back to the caring, Stalin really cared about poetry. So he was always watching what Anna Matova was writing. So, you know, I sometimes say the one thing that's worse than, you know, to have a president dictator who cares about, uh, who doesn't care about literature is one who really cares about <laughs> literature and then starts to, you know, meddle. So anyway, the, I mean, it's a very complicated story, but it's a story of technologies and who controls them and who has access to them uh, and how writers then under these pressures uh, uh, react uh, and uh, try to evade uh, or succumb to the censorship. Yeah. So pretty much like Martin said, you know, when the poet, what she used to do is she used to call her friends, she used to recite the poem to them, she used to get them to memorize it, and then she used to eat her poem. Very interesting. And if I can just add, and then th she drove her friends crazy because then she would revise. <laughs> and then they had, would have to re remember the revision. Yeah, yeah. So sort of like a class. But Richard, on today's day, I mean, how do you ban anything? Because everything is available here. You and the second, the corollary to that is that one of the, you know, you in your earlier session today talked about the Gandhi incident where, you know, you said your freedom stops at the other person's where your nose begins. So in that kind of situation, where say you have a publication or you have a call to action to lynch somebody by the Ku Klux Klan or some such, how do you then deal with that? Is it all okay? That's Sorry, I put you in the spot. No, it's a great question. I was just uh, turning over some thoughts in my head. And I was thinking also that when you asked me about Color Purple, I was thinking about To Kill a Mockingbird. And uh, you know that was a book which was banned here also. And you can see that the same kind of reasons must have played out for the banning of both books. And uh, when Martin was talking, I was thinking about Fahrenheit 9-11. And it's both a book and a movie, and you might have all seen it, that you know, it's the temperature at which books can be burnt. And um, so anyway, uh, to s I'm saying all this while I'm processing what he's asked. And uh, I think uh, your question is really that, um, how do we deal with freedom of speech when it can harm somebody, if it's full of hate? And who decides what is harmful and what is not, right? That's your question. How do you decide, not who decides? Achha, okay. So basically for me, I think that I would let... It is in this specific case, if there was a publication that called for hatred against a particular community or othered somebody, how would you then react and... You have been through this process, yes, which is yes. the reason I'm asking. No, I would definitely not stock it in, say, a library in my community center. I would definitely go and speak to a bookstore owner or librarian to ask that would you just make it available or would you display it prominently? What are the barriers that you would put in something like this? So I think I would evaluate the extent of harm that it can cause and what kind of hate is it promoting. Because the books that are being banned right now, and that's what I was trying to say, that the, uh, you know, the word that is flagged is pornography, but actually it's just the word breasts used in the whole book, right? So things like what David was talking about, a justification note, you know, which actually looks at the more nuanced approach and sees that, you know, is it pornography? Is it going to uh, eroticize violence done to female bodies? Or is it really just describing breasts? And it's very different. So, so are we saying that pornography should be banned? 
Of course, I'm, I'm for, but I, then I would define pornography, right? Define? So for me, pornography is different from erotica, and pornography is basically violence done, rape with a camera pointed at a woman's body, whereas erotica is for mutual pleasure, so it's not a man raping a woman with a camera pointed and the woman saying no, crying and saying give me more. Because what that does is normalizes violence, and if not just normalizes, eroticizes violence, and fascism breeds on the eroticizing of violence, so there is definitely a connection between the two. Whereas with erotica, there is mutual pleasure in each other's body and not just the guy watching or raping is getting pleasure. Yeah, dude. I, I want to come, I, I come back to that because I think you're absolutely... And the reason, the reason Plato uh, banished the poets, why, why, why banishing the poets was important was because of representation. And that's precisely what we're dealing with right now. You know, it, I, th I think it was Ginsburg. Ginsburg said, like, you know, it, it's all fine to, like, you know, throw a bunch of dog shit on the tomb of Ulysses S. Grant, w but it's not appropriate to write the word shit on his tomb in white ink. It, it, it's all about the representation of the language, and, and that is precisely what's happening right now. It's not about books. Books don't matter. I mean, books are the physical object. It is, the message is what is trying to be erased, and that message is one of uh, primarily race, and sexuality, LGBTQ uh, issues. Those, the primary books that are being banned in this country right now and being, uh, that are on the long list that are being turned in are books, I mean, some of them so innocuous you can't imagine. Yeah. It, it, they are by black authors that are trying to tell a story. You referred to it in the last one, the 1619 Project. Like, that whole project is, there's an attempt to erase that from our history. Uh, to what end? That's the question. To what end? And to legislate it then, to say that these books are uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates, Between Me and the World, right? That book has been banned multiple times. I'm trying to think, like, what in that book is it that you want to ban exactly? You want to ban a voice, a, a, entirely a voice. So it's the words, again, that matter. The book, I think, is probably meaningless in it. And, and it's meaningless in the sense which you can't ban a book today. But, yeah, it's the words that are trying to erase. Arson, the words matter. I mean... Lord of the Rings versus Harry Potter. It's also about the timing, right? I mean, why isn't that Lord of the Rings has been banned, but Harry Potter, which in its time, every child, I know, you know, every time a new Harry Potter came out, our kids were like, you have to get it like today. But now it's banned. Well, Harry Potter. Most of Harry Potter. Harry Potter is a really complicated one. <laughs> really complicated. Because people are banning it on the right because of the magic and the witchcraft or whatever. But J.K. Rowling has come out and has been very vocal in her anti-trans statements. And so I'll give you, we, we don't ban anything at the store. But we the banning of it was because of its witchcraft more than... Right. But, but, I mean, but, the but, removing but, but, of the book was the other But it's also being removed from some bookstores because of J.K. Rowling's position on uh, political position her political position and you know so I I that's very complicated it's kind of getting it from both sides and is 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 it better to you know it's, it's very conflicting I mean, there's a lot of wars in independent bookstores now because the with the younger staff especially this new generation coming up they don't want to see a jk rowling book in the store they're so offended by her political position i I'm a different generation, and I'm kind of with David. We don't, we don't want to censor for any reason, really. And this is one of the best-selling books in the history of the store. And so it's, 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 it's a whole other layer of complication. To, so I, but it does bring up the fact that I think 95% of what's going on right now is coming from the right. But there is like a 5% that's coming from the left. And what worries me, and it's hard for me to try to put this in words, what worries me is that that 5% coming from the left is just going to enable the 95% from the right to some extent. Like, are you for free speech or are you not for free speech? And if one side is making the argument, well, we're for free speech, but if they're against this and they don't do this and they don't do that, then we're not for free speech for those people. But we don't want you to ban the books you want to ban. That, that's, that becomes a very slippery thing. So at the bookstore, I mean, to be honest, we, we don't bring in a lot of uh, books with 
hate content. You know, we don't, we certainly, um, you know, people can special order them, and we will bring them in for that. With J.K. Rowling, um, you know, Harry Potter is kind of ubiquitous, but um, her new books, which are the mysteries that she writes under a different name, we don't feature them in the newsletter. We don't face them out. We bring them in, so they're there, because I don't want to act like there's no demand for them in Boulder, but we've, we've backed off, and if she had never made those anti-trans comments, we'd be promoting them much heavier. Well, the interesting thing is that the Jaipur Literature Festival, we get 50% pushback from the left and 50% from the right, <laughs> but that's a different story. <laughs> Martin, I want to extend this from beyond the book. The OTT platform today, you're seeing, you know, series after series, but they don't seem to have any of these restrictions. You're seeing so much of violence and so much of history reinterpreted in different ways and so many books uh, today being adopted or adapted to an OTT platform. What's the difference? Why is it okay there, but not okay in a printed book which has been published? What do you mean by ODDT? Uh, the, the uh, you know, what television... Oh, oh I uh, see. What is, what is an OTT? Uh, it's a streaming, a streaming platform. platform. I see. Uh, well, I'm not entirely sure what you're asking. Wh Why you is it okay to show those kinds of stories on these streaming yeah. shows on yeah, television? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. that seemed to be okay. Yeah. But w the same thing in a book, in a printed form, is not okay. I'm, you know, I'm, I, I honestly don't know whether that's the case. Um, I wonder whether, though, it has to do with something that you started with, namely that the place, the biggest source of worry, in a way, is young adult, children and young adult. Uh, and, and that's, of course, if you walk into a bookstore, those are starting to be the largest parts of the bookstore also. So uh, I don't know whether... Um, <laughs> You know, parents have control. I, at least they think they have control over what their kids watch. Uh, I, I wonder whether it has to do with the fact that those, you know, streaming platforms are not controlled by schools. Uh, so, and therefore, school libraries. I'm, but I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm a good person to really answer this Richard, question. Richard, did you yeah. want to? Well, yeah, you know, because as uh, Martin said, it's young adults who are really <laughs> bearing the brunt of this book banning because their access to books is often uh, decided by teachers or by bookstore owners or by librarians. And if they are pressured and they said, you can't keep this book or that book, it's young adults who are not getting those books, right? And uh, what then is happening is that it's not OTT because OTT parents can decide what kind of access the kids mm -hmm. can get. Mm -hmm. Uh, even though they know how to go past the proxies, et cetera. <laughs> but uh, it's not a contested issue for two reasons. One is that uh, the political party, which is organizing around uh, book bans, uh, because they need to mobilize the women's vote, and it's basically mothers who are being organized in different uh, mm -hmm. states, is, you know, because we are fighting right now for other reasons, for our bodies and our choices yeah. and all of that, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's very cynically being used, and libraries and bookstores and schools are in community. So it really affects the people who are going to be voting there and then. So the organizing is being done there rather than on OTT. That's the reason I think. The book bans are political, you know. It's not about the content of the book. Margaret Atwood's Handmaid's Tale, political? Of course, the content, I mean, the banning is not political. The book stories, of course, are political because culture is political, right? So it's deeply, deeply political. Even Alice Walker's Color Purple is political. So is To Kill a Mockingbird or Catcher in the Rye or But anything. isn't most culture political? I mean, we've had so many sessions here about culture, about history. Isn't much of this sort of, in many ways, dictated by the politics of the time? And, of course, the geographical space. Are you asking me? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course, culture is political, and I would say that um, uh, not only that, I would say religion is long-term politics, and politics is short-term religion, so it all gets intertwined. 
in uh, what we are trying to share with the community. But what the point I was trying to make about why books are banned and not OTT so much is because books are, are in community, in schools, in libraries, in bookstores. Mm -hmm. Human beings are showing up and it's an organizing thing and the other reason is mm -hmm. because they need to organize women around something. So they're organizing women around their children saying you're protecting your children. But what young adults are telling me as I'm walking up and down America with my book, it's a young adult's book, published by Scholastic, and I'm going into <laughs> Texas and Arizona. And Not been banned yet? No. Or banned? No, about to be banned. because luckily for me, I think my book is not polarizing. It's bringing the left and the right together on the issue of sex trafficking. Now, the approaches may be different of the left and the right, and somewhere in between also, the third way, as Gloria Steinem likes to say. But um, so I think I may not, though I've used the word menstruation, and I've used, the, I have sex in my book and all of that, not graphic, but there. Uh, I think I may not be banned. But another book on sex trafficking has been banned called Sold by Patricia McCormick. But uh, what I feel really is happening is something else. It's a cynical use of turning a community against each other. So we'll come back to this thing of intolerance for a sec. Arsad, what's the role and responsibility of the bookstore in given this sort of wave of intolerance that we're seeing? Well, we, we want to be a community space, much like the library, and we want to make available all, all these books. I mean, I, you know, we've not been approached to ban a book, you know, in, in years. The last one was probably Sally Mann's photographs, you know, in the late 90s. I don't know if people are familiar with those. And, and I just think that we want to be able to be a place where people can come. Now, you know, the bookstore, like a school, we might hear like, why is this book a middle reader rather than teen? Mm -hmm. And you do have to figure those things out. Like, you know, I know that I know schools read like a book like The Kite Runner, okay? And I think that that's perfectly appropriate. My personal opinion is that's perfectly appropriate for probably 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. Now, if we had that middle reader, which is more geared to fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, that, that might be a complaint that we'd have to deal with, you know? But that would be a miss categorization. We certainly wouldn't take the book out of the store. And to be honest, we wouldn't stop a fifth grader from going up to the teen section and buying it either. <laughs> so it's still going to be available. And David, as a library, I mean, today, again, you know, everybody's library is on their phone. You can Google before this session. I checked the pen's latest number of books banned and what's been banned, etc. How do you see libraries reinventing themselves Again, keeping in mind all of the issues that we've been talking about and all of the issues that we've been hearing over the last two and a half days. Yeah, I mean, reinvention, we, we libraries have been in that position for their, the entirety of their existence, right? So we are constantly reinventing ourselves, and I think, you know, one of the focuses we've taken is literacy in all of its forms. But, you know, in this instance, right, so you can get a library card when you're, you can get a library card when you're a baby, but you can get a library card without any co-signer when you're 13 years of age, right? And so at 13 years of age, you are beginning to ask questions about your sexuality, about your history, about your race. And so that is a, 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 a policy that we have had in place uh, in the libraries that I have worked, I think, mostly my entire career. It's not without, you know, controversy, right? But uh, libraries are built from, you know, they're for cradle to grave, but you see it most heavily used and uh, literacy in the form of literature in you know, episodic times in people's lives. And one of those primary times uh, is for that uh, young adult, right? A young adult age. And the access to books is very important. That is, that's the primary question, right? They, people come in and say, can't you just move this to the adult section? Like, well, I could, but a kid can go check a book out wherever they want, right? Like there's no restriction for the kid to go check out a book, and we typically resist attempts to categorize the book as being for a certain age. Frankly, most of the books that are being banned when referencing any kind of thing, form of sexuality are precisely the kinds of questions that 12 and 13 and 14 year old young people are asking themselves. Yeah. Who am I? Like that, and, and the answers to those books uh, the answers to those questions are maybe not palatable to, your par to the parent. The parent's not ready to have the conversation about like, you know, whatever, oral sex. Like, it, it's not something that they're ready to, but the kid has that question, I guarantee it. And so, you know, libraries remain free. I mean, we are free and open and intend to be able to provide um, 
literature for all, right? Like it's... Assuming for a second that all of these, all, all young people primarily come to a library because it's easy to access to discover and read about sex and sexuality, what do older people access and what shouldn't they be reading? Probably the same stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Probably the same stuff, I don't know. <laughs> Karma, salvation, health, uh, well, sex, what? Yeah, I, I don't know. Arson has, <laughs> Arson has a lot of ideas about what people shouldn't read. You, well, you, know, you should do a study thing, on that one. But the one thing I do want to say that, that to me, is I feel like this book banning is a stalking horse. Yeah. People are afraid in this country that you know, uh, white people are afraid that they're losing power. Not all white people, obviously, but white people are afraid that they're losing power. So they don't want 1619 Project out there. But it's, it's not about that. It's they want to maintain power. People are scared for whatever reason about LGBTQ issues and trans issues. And you see these crazy laws about not allowing medical stuff. I think that the books are just like a weird stalking horse for this. Maybe it's just easy. It's shorthand. Books have been banned forever. So we can send a message by trying to ban books right now. Because I'm not seeing a way, you know, a book gets banned and it, it's, it's like trying to hold back the tide. You know, the next way, you know, books are still being published. No one's banning books at the publisher's uh, point at this point. So those books are going to find their way out into the different communities. I read about a library, I, maybe you even know which one, where the library wouldn't ban the books, so some conservative people checked out the offending books and just never returned them. <laughs> and so when this was discovered, other people in the community bought dozens and dozens of copies of these books and gave them to the library. So instead of one copy of this book is gay, the library had 50 copies now. <laughs> so I just think it's a stalking horse and, and it, it's, it's the, the front line for this bigger cultural thing that's going on to keep white people in power in certain places, to keep, uh, to, to uh, guard against sexual, you know, for sexuality, just to have a world where everybody's heterosexual. Well, that's not gonna happen. But I think this is the way you make a statement. Richard, are white people, LGBTQ, fear, all of that. Back home, we are seeing, again, this rewriting of history and, you know, banning of particular kind of books. What's the reason there? I mean, power, yes, but what else? So this is cynical use for an election, and that's a much more long-term plan, right? To make us think differently about our history and create different heroes out of that history which is re being recreated. So um, there are textbooks in certain states in India where Gandhi is being called a traitor and his assassin is being called a patriot. And there are children who are 12 and 13 who are coming back and yelling at their mothers and saying, you taught us everything ro wrong, you lied. And I have a friend who's a mother who just moved out of a state from Dehradun because that was taught to her son. And uh, so this kind of rewriting history will then create heroes in the minds of kids of uh, someone who stood for nonviolence as a traitor and someone who was an assassin as a hero. So think about the messaging and what the child is learning in school. And it's also happening with other things. Mythology is being treated as history. History is being obliterated. Uh, whole periods, you know, when she had Mughal rule, sometimes are removed from textbooks. So uh, children are going to grow up ignorant. And, uh, you know, what does that mean long term for India is uh, extremely dangerous because it's going to be go beyond the elections right now. Martin, before we open it up, rewriting history, is it the fashion of the times? And despite that, will those foundational texts sort of still continue uh, to be rediscovered again and again and again? I mean, rewriting of history has always happened. And it's interesting that you keep uh, coming back somehow in your questions to these foundational texts. These are religious texts or foundational epics, the Epic of Gilgamesh, the you know, South Asian epics, uh, Homeric epics, Bible, so on and so forth. W you know, the dynamic there is, I think, how we interpret these texts. There are huge battles over interpretation. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in that book, The Written World, I, I coined this term textual fundamentalism because often diff forms of fundamentalism define themselves through a certain kind of interpretation of, let's say, the, the Bible or other texts or you know, the Sanskrit classics or the Vedas or, or other texts. 
And so there, I think it's less, the dynamic is less, should we ban these books or not, because they're everywhere and they're foundational, as you say. You can't sort of just remove them from the culture, but you can control them by creating institutions of interpretation, by controlling interpretation, and that's how that dynamic, I think, and that rewriting, if you will, or that where, where, where a sort of uh, power plays play themselves out through, in not so much through censorship, but through interpretation and certain kinds of interpretation. Controlling interpretation. Uh, questions. We'll take some from here, some from there, and we'll take it in sort of groups. Yeah, go ahead. And short questions so we can get as many. And Here's a short one. Is this on? Um, um, but it would help me out greatly. I have a negative relationship with a bookseller at the Bookworm bookstore out here that sells used books. And it's because I find Mein Kampf in the philosophy section. And I have to say, I'm not trying to call it a foundational text. I'm not trying to censor it. I'm trying to remind you it's European history and that's where it belongs. I, uh, you know, help me with this relationship. Is it philosophy or is it uh, European history? It's a foundational <laughs> text, just by the way. <laughs> I mean, it's certainly not philosophy. Uh, I mean, it's an attempt uh, by this autodidact, Adolf Hitler, who pieced together a kind of world history, you know, seen through a particular lens. Uh, uh, I, yes, I mean, it should, I guess it should be in history or whatever, but certainly not in philosophy. Uh, um, and, you know, I grew up in Germany, uh, and Mein Kampf was, was actually banned in Germany for the longest time. Um, it, it no longer is now, but uh, that is also an interesting uh, history. In Taipei, yeah, I, I mean, in, in College Street, you could, when it was banned in most parts of the world, you could buy it in Calcutta and College Street. Another question? Any? Yeah. Vinod? It's a very interesting discussion. I find that the books are banned for trivial reasons like uh, Charles Dar uh, Darwin's evolution theory. I mean, there's no way theory of evolution can cause violence or hatred. So some very trivial reasons, violence is, if it promotes violence, yes, something can be said about it. But a science book cannot be, cannot be violent creative. Question is, what is the answer? What is the solution? I thought one solution to try is produce so many books and become so cheap. The technology is the answer. I mean, I can have blog, I can write whatever I want in the blog, who is going to stop all the blogs? So if it is available in so much of volume, then one solution is right there. What is your opinion about it? A Lutheran solution. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I agree that, and I think it's interesting that all the books that have been banned, they're all available. So, I, and I think precisely because of the, you know, dynamic you describe. Last question. Hi, so, um, so my question is about, uh, so we've talked about books being banned uh, and, and still existing. My question is, if books are being banned, is it gonna frighten authors from writing them, or is it going to energize them further to write them and figure out different ways for them to be published? Who wants to take that? Well, I, I mean, I'm not an author, so I'm probably the worst person to take this. But I will say, from a book selling point of view, at this point in time, getting your book banned is a good way to sell it. <laughs> you know, so if I was an author, I wouldn't shy away from that content, and I'd be like. It's not going to be banned in 95% of the places. It might get banned in, a f in Florida or wherever. And then that's going to create all this press that's almost impossible to get in this day and age for a book. <laughs> so I, I don't know what the authors think of that. Like you mentioned Patricia McCormick's book, right? Yeah. That's a bestseller. <laughs> I, you know, or Toni Morrison. Yeah. So yeah, book banning is not something which is going to deter authors. Because we have stories to tell and we are going to tell it come what may and take on the odds. Uh, sometimes, you know, maybe even write it on a scroll and put it into a um, wall and hide it behind a brick, but we'll do it. We will definitely do it. There so was a question from this side. Yeah, go ahead. Arsene, you had mentioned that the new workforce, right, the, the younger 
people, they don't want to, let's say, keep Harry Potter because of the views of the author, right? So from your vantage point, are you seeing the new generation? Are they more quick to react and ban something because they've been, uh, you know, it's so easy to block on social media? Are you seeing the new generation more adapting and accommodating of, of a voice that they don't agree with? I, I think the new generation, uh, the, the younger people, and I, I, you know, I hate to you know, paint a broad brush here, but um, they're they're more apt to say this this book can do harm. This book again, it's the power of a book. You know, this book. You know, I, I'm you know I'm a trans person, and to see this anti-trans book and put it on the shelf harms me. We shouldn't have it. You know, that's where they're coming from. Um, it's it's a place of of vulnerability, and so we we certainly want to respect that. But at the same time, at the store, we say, well, th but we also have these other values, and we try to deal with the most of these books. To be honest, we don't put on the shelf, but they are they can be special ordered. You know, we're not going to tell our customers you can't have this book. Um, but you know, that's where I think they're coming from. Is is they're they're. They're trying to live in a new world. They're trying to live in a more pluralistic world. And these texts that are misogynistic or these texts that are, uh, you know, they see as racist, or, you know, or they're much more sensitive in saying, okay, well, free speech is great, but this book does harm. Last question from each of you. Blocking Trump, banning a book, is it the same thing? <laughs> no, it's not the same thing. And how could you block Trump? Do, do you think he was really blocked? He got his word out. You know, come on. <laughs> so can you ban a book in the same way? Well, banning books, like I said, also you can't really do in this, at this point in time. I mean, I think the most important thing is to keep our democracy strong. Because if, if you know, there is a right-wing sweep, and if Trump comes in and DeSantis has power and we, we live in a world of Florida and Texas, maybe you will start seeing books banned at the publisher level, mm -hmm. and then they won't be out there. So I, I think, and you look where, where people can vote, you know, we, we've seen this with abortion. States like Kansas suddenly are passing amendments to keep abortion legal. You know, I don't think this can pass democratically, but we need to keep the democracy. Same. I don't think books should be banned. I don't think Trump should be blocked. Uh, I think the conversation has to continue. And the only way to defeat a bad idea is with a better one. And we certainly have better ideas. And we have to just get it out there. I, I agree with what the person said. <laughs> yeah, I also agree. And it, it is, you know, so I described parental panic. There's also, I mean, there are other reasons for banning a book. And what we're seeing now is kind of what we've characterized as either it, it is one of two things, and they're also both quite common, right, is a crisis of legitimacy. There's a, there's a voice that suddenly feels like it's not the primary voice and wants to maintain power, and then subsequently there is also the will to power, right? So that is that is a, a form of banning books, which we're not there yet. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think the question, um, I'm not into, we're not into banning anything <laughs> or any voices, yeah. So the only way to trump a bad idea is to have a better idea. That's what we do at JLF. <laughs> Thank you all so very much for being here. Uh, to all our volunteers and, of course, our wonderful tech crew and all my colleagues at Teamwork Arts and Suraj and everybody and all our writers. Thank you all and see you next year at the 10th JLF here in Colorado at the Boulder Public Library. Suraj, back over to you. And just to tell you that a big thank you to Abhishek for that beautiful installation that he's created. Anybody who wants to acquire it can send us an email and we'll put you in touch with his publicist. So if you'll give me And the bookstore is still open and the authors are still here, uh, even though they haven't been banned. In case they're banned, do go and buy their books. And uh, yeah. yeah. So if you'll give us two more minutes, we have on audience request and my personal request as well, we have asked and we, have re, uh, invi we are re-inviting Jovan for one last poem to do oh, the wow. closing. Oh. Uh, this yeah. is fine.
this is fine. Is it, they're on, right? Yep. Yeah. Um. So, uh, okay. <laughs> so this this whole time listening to this discussion has kind of made me think about where I started here, um, talking about this Preston Porter story, and um, what's been impressive to me is uh, a part of the Community Remembrance Project is getting historical markers erected in places where these things have taken place. And so we had to do the task of going to Lyman, Colorado to dig up the bones of a ghost that they have worked endlessly to bury. And it's really interesting to watch how hard people have worked to make sure that this did not exist. The Lyman Historical Society Museum who has like two visitors a day. <laughs> what they would benefit from if they partnered with the Community Remembrance Project just to have visitation, the work. We tried to go, we, once they denied trying to get a historical marker correct, er, erected, we're like, okay, we'll just go to the schools. Naturally, the schools will be historically endowed and want to um, entertain this rejection there. And um, it just had me thinking about this community, not, and I'm not indoctrinating their whole community, but that community in general, and how hard it had to work to create this event and then also caretake its secrecy. So this poem's a little fresh, um, but I wanted to share this. Um, it's, a, it's sort of a sequel to the poem that I shared before. Um, and again, just to remind you, the um, murder rape of the child, um, that child's name was Mary Louise. This poem's about her father. I don't know Mary Louise's father, but I know he was a man for details, a peculiar type who sought the best for his daughter. I imagine her doll collection, each one placed in perfect order and how at Christmas she sat on her daddy's lap and was gifted that for the gift that she was. I don't mar know Mary Louise's father, but I know he was a man with imagination, could see the town folk as lanterns, as torches, as pitchforks and shovels. In 1900, the population of unincorporated Lyman County was 75 people. At the train station to abduct Preston, 300 men showed up. Crops erupting from the blood-hungry land, blood-hungry harvest, calm, emotionless, still-faced reapers. I don't know Mary Louise's father, but I know a man who knew midnight better than they know themselves, who knew, their, who knew disclosure, who knew terror, who cackled to the sky, hooved, horned, dragon-tailed massacres. It is said that, the under, that underground, the Big Sandy Creek still runs to this day a bloodline where they wash their clothes clean of soot, of story, of sin, of serenity. The same water 36 years prior that stole hundreds of lives of innocent Cheyenne and Arapaho at Sand Creek. Grandfathers, grandmothers, grandchildren. I don't know Mary Louise's father, but I know he was an orchestrator, a coordinator, a marionette man. I imagine their discussions at the dinner table Imagined all the ways, all the ropes, all the whips, all the drowning, all the electricity, all the firing squads, and a light bulb with a fire filament. I imagined a delegation. How the wives dressed the children stood the sons on chairs and tied their ties, stood the daughters on chairs and bouquetted their bows, fixed their bonnets for the grand spectacle, and I imagined their excitement and how this is just their heritage, the kerosene, the lumber, sending a team to erect a rail line, the invitations, the registry, the concessions, the constituents, the trail ride, 
the grandfathers, the grandmothers, and the grandchildren. I don't know Mary Louise's father, but I imagine him ironclad, a God-fearing man, a loving husband with a belly full of hornets, a scavenger who knew how to pick a carcass clean. Oh, snap. I do not know what he sees in a mirror. <laughs> I do not know what he sees in a mirror. I don't know what haunts his headroom. I don't know if gas chamber mouths ever taste anything but the bones reminding them that forgetting is not an option. You will have to return here. You will have to come back to the ground that you put them in. Thank you. Joanne Mears, ladies and gentlemen. What an incredible way to close the festival, that powerful session on banning of the books, and then, of course, Joanne Mays. As we draw the curtains on another inspiring and thought-provoking edition of JLF in Boulder, it is with a heart full of gratitude and a mind enriched with ideas that I stand before you to deliver these closing remarks on behalf of Namita Gokhale, William Dalrymple, Sanjoy Roy, Jesse Fredman, David Farnan, and all my colleagues at JLF Colorado, Team Book Arts, and Boulder Public Library. What incredible last three days have been. For us, JLF in Boulder has always been more than just a gathering of authors and readers. It is a celebration of diversity, a platform for dialogue, and a testament to the power of literature to bridge divides and foster understanding. In these challenging times, when the world often seems fragmented, the festival tries to serve as a reminder that through literature and the arts, we can find common ground and connect with one another on a deep and meaningful level. As we leave this beautiful setting tonight, I encourage each of you to carry the spirit of this festival with you. Let the ideas and conversations you have encountered here continue to inspire and inform your thoughts and actions. Let us remember that literature has the power to challenge our assumptions, broaden our horizons, and change the way we see the world. Thank you all for being part of this incredible journey, and we look forward to seeing you again next year as we will come together for the 10th edition to celebrate the magic of words and ideas at the JLF in Boulder. Until then, stay safe, and may the pages of your lives be filled with the most beautiful stories. Thank you, and have a lovely night. <laughs>